a sidekick. Not, what's in it for me? 
So we had to create an incentive structure and basically when you look at blockchain networks, they allow a new way to redistribute value across all the participants in the network. So the goal of our payment and reward system is not only, but it is mostly to incentivize anyone that contributes to the network so to drive adoption uh, at scale. So if you're an issuer, you're contributing to the network. If you're a credential agent operator operating the infrastructure that allows universities, employees to issue and verify credentials, then you have to be rewarded for that. If you're running a node, you're rewarded for that. Same as with Ethereum and, and Bitcoin. What are they rewarded for? They're rewarded for the, the, the miners. They're rewarded for operating the infrastructure of Ethereum. Right? The same principle. Right? So that's the reward uh, piece. We'll get to that. There's a, there's a significant aspect of that that we'll cover when we talk about some of the restrictions that we place. But there, and what's, not, what's still in place, which is a market, We'll talk about how that really relates to this concept, right? So, you've got, essentially, I mean, this sounds like sort of motherhood and apple pie, Con contributors earn and relying parties pay. That's the way the market works, right? So the idea is that the people that are issuing the records, companies that are issuing the records, are going to get a reward. And in fact, if you get into the details, the node operators are also getting a reward because they're running the network effectively. And then the people that want access to those records are going to pay. They pay in credits. Okay? And when we get to the market aspect of this, that's where the balance point is that controls the value of the credits versus a fiat currency. It's pegged by what the perceived value of those credentials actually is. And by the way, that's what generates the natural equilibrium in the market. But then, um, I also have to say, one of the things we've done, we've had a lot of questions over this. I think the most important thing we did, more than building mathematical models, and we've provided these models to, to various folks and they're building their own. And I, I know we've got, you know, we've gotten questions about, well, you know, what does this mean about what kind of money I'm going to make of this? At the end of the day, we can provide a model and you sort of have to build your own on top of that. The key that you, I think the most fundamentally important thing we did is create a strong governance aspect to this microeconomy in the, the board, right? So we, we spent a lot of time talking at the board level and putting in the, in the bylaws about how uh, board resolutions would be done to deal with economic situations, right? And we're going to talk about some of the parameters. The point I'm making here is we've put in a very, very good control element to be able to make adjustments to the parameters of the economy if things don't work out the way the model says, right? So if something goes haywire, we can make adjustments, but there, it was a well thought through approach. We can't make those adjustments uh, willy-nilly. It requires a pretty high bar to, uh, to, to get uh, changes to the actual economic system. But the bar is also not impossible, so I think we picked the right. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Yeah, so, I mean, you have uh, many decisions, policies, uh, the rule book, right, is decided on the board level. The board gets elected every year by network members. We'll talk about it in a minute. In, 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 uh, we're not talking about it today. today. Um, so there's a simple majority, right, decisions. There's super majority decisions. And then there's unanimous vote decision on the payment and rewards. So anything that changes the internal economy has to have unanimous consensus across all board members to change it. So it's possible that the bar is very high and everybody needs to agree that this caused uh, a change in the uh, parameters and structure of the payment and reward system. So, as you can see, as Jim said, the network pays the contributors with plastic chips called Velocity Credits. They get it to their wallet, they stack it. On the other side, anyone that wants to access the blockchain, retrieve
retrieve keys to verify credentials shared with them by the individual have to pay those same public, uh, plastic chips to access the network that's create that creates a market, a demand side, and a supply side. And this is how the internal economy is built. And since we don't have a lot of time, then this is the full picture. Earners earn, and then they sell it to the uh, relying party who are the demand side, and then they pay it back to the network, and then it goes back to in a cyclic uh, uh, na uh, uh, manner, goes back to the content. And this is how the value flows within the network. Comments, uh, speculative trading, that's a good one and bad to the market. This is the one I wanted to talk so, so I want to talk about what we did to basically make this not look like tokens or full cryptocurrency. We removed, uh, we implemented non-circularity and no speculation, right? Non-circularity means that I can't, as, I can't ex exchange tokens with another party for, for like tokens. So I can't, as a, you know, issuer, start trading with another issuer, so that's not allowed. We also don't allow any, we, there is absolutely no uh, fiat exchange as a general sense, meaning I can't as an investor just come in here and pay fiat currency to drive up the, the cost of tokens. Why do we want to do, why do we want to limit those things? Because we're implementing a microeconomy where the balance point of the value versus fiat is based solely on the utility of that, of that, of that product or service you're providing, right? And why, go ahead. Well, so it's technically, is it a stable? No, because it's not pegged to the, it's not pegged to the dollar. The exchange rate is determined by the perceived value of the credential being issued. And by the way, the credential cost is constant, it's 90. Okay, but where, where this exchange rate comes in place, a couple of things. Uh, it's hard to get into this without talking about all of it at the same time. The, what, what goes on is that only, uh, credits can only be held by issuers or note offers. So you, you have to essentially earn them that way. If you purchase credits, you have to immediately spend them. And the only thing you can spend them on is to buy uh, essentially tickets to do the, to the vouchers to do the verifications. So you following the limits? So effectively, what is really going on is the people that don't, that aren't issuing themselves but need to inspect the records, they're going to have to buy those records from the market and they have to use fiat currency to buy those. That's where the price neutral point is set, is what are they willing to pay, which is related to the perceived value of the record, and then what are the sellers, meaning the issuers that have the credits, willing to sell them for? Let, Does that let, make sense, Rory? Let, let me, uh, Let's show that. Let me uh, give you an example, okay? I'm a seller of credential. I'm a node operator, or I'm a big issuer, and I have now, 600 million credits in my pocket and I want to sell a million so I'm basically given a sell order to that million and I want to get one cent for each of my credits that's the sell order and I push it to the marketplace on the other side, the demand side they need to buy 90 credits for each verification that they want to do Okay, now those 90 credits makes the verification cost 90 cents if they buy it from me. So then they're in a position to decide whether the transaction is worth 90 cents or not. If it's worth 90 cents, they will buy it. If it's worth a dollar, they might buy it the next time when another seller would ask for 1.1 cent per each of the credits. Right? And and in the context where traditional background screening costs between $70 to $120 per transaction, right? we have a long way until the transaction value would match the current cost of manual uh, 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 service. So just imagine how much, uh, um, how much, uh, appreciation 
we can see uh, from from um, the cost of the, from the from the the exchange rate of, of the credit. The current model, and it's just that it's a model, right? And the part of this again, mo it, things may not come out exactly like the model. The current model shows that effectively the 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 fiat value of a credential expressed in dollars in dollar in credits is night. In dollars, I think it's less it's less than a dollar, like seventy cents. And it escalates about a dollar by year two, and it goes up by year five or six to something like five dollars, and then it continues to escalate. And by the way, we may have to put in different controls in the out years to halt or level off that escalation, but that's a long way out, right? But first, we've got to worry about the startup part of this. But initially, the, the, the cost of those, of, of a credential on, on the Velocity Network, is actually going to be a lot less than what the background screen. Yeah. typically charge. And this is a this is a graph that shows basically the overall financial transactions or the overall uh, economic value that would run in the system if things would go in according toward demand uh, projections. That means that by year ten, right, we'll have billions of dollars worth of credits running through exchanging hands in the ecosystem, right? And the organizations that will be running first will claim the majority of that industry that is just being created by this ecosystem. And if you look at the appreciation of the credit price that is projected, right? That's, these are the numbers. Right? It's going to be a hundred times fall in ten years if right, the network will behave and according to the demand it could be better. But then maybe it could be so much better that the foundation will have to make decisions on how to slow down the economy because it creates uh, negative consequences. So the foundation is a central bank. The board is basically the, uh, how do you call it in the... Federal Reserve. Federal Reserve, yeah. The board of the Federal Reserve, right? They will take decisions. They have to uh, take decisions unanimously, right? If you can, make sure you're on the board. How you make sure you're on the board? You start claiming your credits, issuing, contributing to the network because that will get you to the board. And then you're part of that decision process. Yeah. Is there um, a, a finite number? Oh, I think you're getting into that now. Is there a there fi is. finite number of, of uh, coins? Oh, yes. And then also, how are new coins being issued? So it's 100 billion coins, I think. That's, yeah, that's a finite, a finite number. number. Now, we can't... So one of the control elements is if we need to, we can issue more. Print more money. But we're not going to do that unless we absolutely need to, right? If we print more money, right? the holders of current credentials will be losing. Most of those holders will have a seat on the board. So printing more money will, will be a dramatic decision that will be taken only for the health of the overall ecosystem. So you have fractionals of credits? So in other words, yes. if you could avoid having to print more, yes. you have fractions. Yes. Yeah, in fact, I think we're doing that on the reward side, we're doing that for micro. Yes. We, we, we didn't, that wasn't an original concept that came later. We came up with this concept of a micro-credential. Yeah. I think is a if, you're a, if you're a gig work, if you're a gig work platform and you're issuing uh, 30 credentials per individual per year, it's just not okay that you will be earning as much credit as a university or something like that. So you have micro-credentials and you have credentials and micro-credentials are just a fraction. Seventy cents, like the fair market value opening. It's ninety credits. Ninety credits. And how many credits are you issuing to the issuer? Nine credits per nine, credential. Nine credits. So why would we not just mix the value and, and not have this thing float and run the risk of it? Who, who 
who am I to fix the value? Who am I to fix the value? Who am I? There's no speculation. speculations. You, how, how are we going to have speculation this morning? There isn't. It. We've stopped it. You can't. You, there's no. The only people that can actually be involved in it are people that have a vested interest in the network, right? The, the whole spe speculation aspect of this has been eliminated. You, you can't, cannot buy. There's no market that interfaces for general speculation to the to fiat. You, you, you cannot can buy. Huh? Can't. So here's here's the thing. The issuers can hold on to the credits. So, but at some point, and I've thought about this long and hard, and that's probably one of the variables. We don't know how exactly it's going to pan out. But at some point, the issuers are going to want to extract some real monetary value out of their investment. Almost nobody hoards everything. So this, and by the way, this is related to the liquidity question. There, there has to be an assumed fraction of liquidation of issued credits to m make the market, right? Is everyone following me? So there's a certain pool that's already been issued and preloaded to the foundation to provide market-making liquidity, but additional liquidity is, is, is going to come from the issuers wanting to cash out. And the pre the pre there's a balance point there, too. The issuer, from this investment curve, obviously, the longer you hold on to it, the more valuable it is. However, it, you also have pressure to extract some mon monetary thing out of it now that, that put, puts pressure on you actually putting it on the market. So does that make sense? Exactly where that balance point is is a point because of question. Maybe you could put some parameters around that to limit the period of time that you're holding. Why would I do that? Why would I intervene? To keep the, the tokens in movement. If, you, if they don't move. You say you're, so, how, so you're asking about uh, basically it's called uh, money velocity, right? So this is when the found this is the role of market makers, and the foundation itself will also act as a market maker. The foundation has forty billion tokens. Sorry, that's right. Uh, a, 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 how do you call that the agency? ACC. What? The agency that you shouldn't say. SEC. SEC. Hope the SEC is not listening. But. Uh, um, <laughs> So as we're taking the hundred billion and forty of it's going to the market yeah. the central store, which means that it's going to be the reason. Part of the reason that was done that way is to buy us a lot of time before we actually really run out of. So we have to sort of measure what the balance point is going to be. We have to see the behavior of issuers. The forty billion is a lot of market making liquidity. Does but, that make sense? It's yeah. probably larger than what you would typically see in a micro economy like this. But I think it. Yeah. But, but the important thing is that the foundation is never going to be in a position, right, to decide that the transaction cost should be a dollar, two dollars, three dollars. These are concepts of SaaS, of a centralized proprietary infrastructure in the context of a global, worldwide, open public infrastructure. The only one that, that that can decide the value of the credit is the market, and the market will stop buying credits if the transaction, the verification that they want to execute with these credits, will become too high. And then they will resort to other ways of verifying credentials, which might be, again, manually. Right, like making phone calls and procuring data from silent sources. Yes, Ben. Uh, just a quick question. So, so uh, to prevent people from flooding the, the blockchain with useless credentials, the credits are only released, they're only issued if the credentials are accepted by the. Yeah, you can't. So you can't uh, remember credential issuance has to have a context. Yeah. You can't. You, there's no such thing as just. Like building a database, the, the individual have to. If I publish all diplomas from the University of California, that, does, that's, that's, that concept doesn't exist. It's meaningless. But they every, if they all accept it, then all those all those criteria. Right? Every student has to come to you and accept the credential. That triggers right. the credit in you. Yeah. Now, By the way, now I, I'll just go ahead and say, our own for our own purposes, like us, we have some proprietary databases that. Position us very well to do proxy or notary credential issuing in certain contexts, but we actually can't do it from a velocity.
policy network standpoint until the context is actually generated. Does that make sense? But you may you may offer those. Absolutely. But it's the user that has to user that has to take it. To take it. Yes. So um, the second line in the table, um, nine credits per credential and 0.75 per micro credential. Who decides what's a credential and what's a micro credential? And then also upstairs they were talking about um, employment verification. So if I want to verify that you worked at Google, does that equal checking a credential or a micro credential? No, these, these are not checking. This is the reward. No, but he's so asking. Why so is an employment pay, credential like a, 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 like a that credential issuing credential is your reward? Right, but so that's a reward. But who decides what's a credential and what's a micro credential? It's, it's different. It's different uh, qualities of credential. So, oh, so is a bachelor's right. degree credential? This. Is a master's that's degree the, credential? That's one of my favorite topics. So, first of all, who decides? The board of the foundation with its advisors. So we took a monetary economist, modeled the economy, and the balance points that we had to achieve where when a credential was rewarded with nine credits and micro with this, okay? That was based on assumptions of the supply of credentials to the market that might not hold. So this may change in the future, right? It's an experiment in economy. This may change in the future. But I think that we have the governance structure and the processes to maintain a healthy economy where everybody wins. That's one thing. But then the question is, who decides what's a credential and what's a micro-credential? And why does, I, I get asked, why does all credentials reward it equally? Do you really think that you should reward Harvard for their credential as you reward some local, um, I don't know. Yeah, but where's the uh, line? That's the question, right? What? Like, wh where's the line? So you have a bachelor's, which is four years. There's a master's. Then there's Udacity that offers nine month degrees. Then there's your guy from Udemy that like just uploaded a course. It's very dangerous for the central network to start setting. So everything, everything, right? everything, everything is a credential. Yeah. Everything is a credential, right? But you have things that are really in terms of their quantity, it just doesn't make sense. And it's mainly in the contingent workforce space. So if you basically move, uh, if you basically work on some gig platform, right, and you do coding for two days here, and coding for two days here, and coding for one day here, and each of those will be a record that will be issued to you, that can constitute a credential, it, just, it will just, Break the balance. Who decided that? It's a velocity network foundation. But I thought it was you were asking something else. I thought you were asking why would Harvard for its degree get rewarded the same like some local neighborhood college for their degree? No, it's the same degree type. What yeah. I'm asking about is Trust me that you were very quick to say no, it's the same record and you're rewarding for the issuing, not for the credential itself. The credentials was were paid, was paid by the individual, not by the network. That debate is a two-hour debate with some, with, with many people. So I, I, I appreciate that. So with the, with the micro, an example of a micro credential would be like certification, like I got a scrum certification. No, certification is a credential. Full credential. Certification is a credential. It's just gig work. Right now it's only a, 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 very, a very select set of gig works. Six currently different schemas. Yeah. I, I just saw a challenge to keep an eye on the contingent work right. side of things because when I came out of it, we had categories of labor that were operating at about a 19 month assignment Correct. level, whereas both permanent jobs Correct. were lasting less than a year. Correct. I think that's right. I mean, you know, we, we may end up, I think Gore's right, this is the area that may have to be tweaked. And you know, we may end up doing something with the cost side too eventually, but you know I think we've got we got to get it started. Before we need the vessel of a job, the 
was something that meant long-term employment. That's not what's of value now as much as the skills. So that's where I just say so many. some things may shift along the way that you have to, the board will have to have value. Right. There are so many questions like that. Let me ask you another question, right? We made a decision that the relying parties are not paying per credential, per verification of a credential, but per a presentation of, cre of a set of credentials. So basically, the individual share 10, 2, 4, depending on the use case. And it doesn't matter if they're sharing 2 or 22. For the relying party, they send that batch quote unquote, to verify, to be verified, and they get the results back, and they pay for the presentation the same. Why did we do that? Because this is how they think now. Do they pay you differently if the individual had two degrees or one degree? Depends on the business. Then <laughs> <laughs> healthcare, yes. It's All right. The same. All right. So, but usually they just pay one time per capita, but. It just doesn't make sense. And we will change it in 10 years. Because you have to pay per gas, per transaction, not per presentation. Things will change. I think what you should feel is that there are so many checks and balances before things will change that your investment is secure. Because anyone that sits on that board has a vested interest in these credits and will not let it uh, slide un unless it's critical for the network to succeed and to, for them to secure their assets. I think that's actually the, probably the most important point, is that this, which goes back to another point that was made in one of the earlier presentations, to me the real power of this is that the network itself is a utility layer, pure utility layer, and the board is composed of a, you know, the top, essentially representative companies as part of the network. And it's, you know, the directors that are, are, they have a fiduciary duty to do what's right for, for the network. And the network is essentially a neutral party. And so to me, that's much better than a situation where you've got some proprietary single company in control of the network who's arranging things just for their own benefit. How many business? How many businesses went out of business when Google decided to change something in their APIs or in their policies, how, would you? I mean, I don't think Zynga is going to develop any more games on top of Facebook because Facebook just shut it down, right? So that's or, not or Amazon's marketplace, Amazon's where we find out that the people that are participating in the marketplace, Amazon's stealing from them their their intellectual property and things. And yeah, so 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 that's not going to happen here. So you brought something up in passing that probably a lot of people didn't catch, but you mentioned gas. So this is built on Ethereum, correct? Yeah, but that's yeah, but that's not why I why I uh, use gas. I use gas because it's a good concept, right? You have a network; it has to be you have, you have to pay for the computational resources. We, by the way, selected um, Ethereum not because of that. Our, Ethereum in the context of a loss of network does not require gas at all. Gas is a concept that equals the credit and the vouchers on our on our system. And that's really the control of a transaction loss and pressure on yeah. Ethereum as a public blockchain where you've got overload, basically you've got too many transactions. And for, I think we've done models. We're not gonna approach anytime soon even fractional uh, utilization of the blockchain's capacity from a transaction perspective. So the fee part of it is kind of irrelevant, yeah. right? So we don't have to worry about that. Just to get the numbers right. So let's say if I look at the table, and we as an identity issuer issue, let's say, a driving license credential and a passport credential, so I get a nine times two, I suppose. Yep. And if an inspector looks at the whole package, as you say, it would pay 90 credits. To yeah, they, if that, if both state. those credentials belong to the same person. Right. And someone inspected that person's wallet credentials that they authorized to release, they'd pay 90. Right, okay. 
So if they had four, but if those credentials were spread across two people, then you'd have to, it, it would be two separate presentations. Yeah, I mean, right? that, that is clear. I mean, any inspector can inspect only one individual credential in one package. That's right. So individual, so if it is just one passport credential, it's nine credits, but the relying party would pay 90 credits to inspect. So at lower number of credentials, the economics may not work out for the relying party, but then they'll have to make that decision themselves. Yeah. Okay. And the seller can put up some of the rewards they have under the market and collect some of that $90. But who, but who sells them that 90 credits? The issue. You do. You and others. So you have to decide how much you're going to hold in reserve versus how much you're going to put back on the market to allow the inspectors to basically buy their access, right? Robert. That's the balance point. Yes, Robert. I'm trying to get my little head around. If, if you've got something like a UK right to work, high level of assurance, you have to do quite a lot more work on verifying that um, right to work. And that cost kind of means, okay, I'm, I'm not so keen to do all of that work to get nine credits compared to the cheaper one. Obviously, there's a market of relying parties who may say, I'd like to see highs as well as mediums, but the issuer is only getting nine credits for the expensive credential that they're going to issue compared to the cheap one. Is, it, is, is this only going to work sometimes for cheap? So, so your use case or your situation where you, as an identity service provider, where you manufacture the data to issue the credential in real time is very unique. You're the only type of issuer that does that because if I'm an employer, the data about the individual, that's just part of my business. If I'm a university, yes, I have the data on the individual. The only extra thing I'm doing is to issue the credential, and then, you know, even if it's a very complicated uh, set of, of, of records, I already have it, because I track my students' data as part of my business, not as part of the issue. So, this is exactly the conversation that that the foundation needs to do with uh, regards to that type of specific issuers and we need to come to a better structure that would fit that unique uh, position because identity issuers are the only issuers that, act, that perform work to create the data not the credential everybody else have the data just issuing it as a credential And uh, by the way, and I think we should change it so that it would f the model will have another section that fits only identity issuers because it's a whole different ballgame. So maybe you come up with a higher number so it ends up getting up with three different issuers. Do you think there's any, you know, if, if I use my degree, I phone them up and they say for 50 quid we'll give you, you know, number one in the post, I get 50 quid. Oh, yeah. So if, if you lose your. As well. and, and are they going to look at this? Because you know, university degrees are probably a really valuable yeah. credential to get into the system. Are they going to go, no chance, am I yeah. doing it for my credits? I'll do it for what I perceive to be a lot more money. So, so when we talk to them, they sing a very different tune. They say, this is not a business for us. Right. This is cost coverage. Mm -hmm. right. We have 20 people and printers and phones, and office, and liability, and lawyers, and blah, 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 and that costs the $50. We're not making money on, on that 
Now, if you can give me a way to do it at zero cost, because literally it's completely automated, the individual yeah. basically calls the system of records, and the system of records issues verifiable credential, and you also allow me to monetize this, where do I sign? That's a very different too. Having said that, right, if I would talk to the head of these 20 people, asking for their job, right, they will say no, that's bad. If we go above their head, they will say yes, because it's going to eliminate some uh, resources in, in this university. We're done. Uh, what was that? With that beautiful Spanish accent. It's worth what? Catalan. Catalan, sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. So, uh, in, in, a, in a world where parental will be issued in velocity, but in other circles. So, you, you will have a world with parental that comes from PSI and Europe and and, and, and then also. This, this model of yeah, yeah. So the whole notion of um, the whole notion of uh, the of the whole verification protocol of the velocity network is unique in that sense that it's behind the payment wall. The only reason why it's behind the payment wall is to allow the network to reward the issuers. This is why this room is full. I don't know of any other network that has even, you know, 10% of the attraction. The incentivization of the issuers, of the node operators, that, 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 was, that, that is one of the uh, secret sauce. Now, if an individual will share credentials, part of them originated in the velocity network and part originated in other networks, right? The velocity credential agent know how to slice and dice and follow a different protocol for each of the credential. So credentials that are anchored to the European blockchain initiatives, right, will be uh, verified one way. Credentials that use the uh, velocity uh, verification method will be requiring the payment. So the answer is yes. The other way around, I'm not so sure. Right? So if a velocity credentials would be shared to a credential agent that does not recognize velocity, then it's not going to work. 